On November 30th, 1979, the musical genius that was Pink Floyd released an album which would place the band at the pinnacle of the recording industry and make a permanent mark on FM airwaves. The album has sold over 23 million copies and remains one of the top-selling titles of all time. More than a collection of great songs, the recording was a high-concept epic about a troubled boy who tried desperately to shut out the world. The telling of this story happened only 30 times on stages in Los Angeles, New York, Dortmund, and London. The music was performed in sync with stunning visual aids that flashed on giant screens, giant inflatables that flew through the air, and the step-by-step -step laying of mammoth bricks, which eventually separated the band from the audience. These shows were the first significant demonstrations of modern multimedia experience. Constructing these infamous stages was a complex process that combined unique art with unprecedented mechanical prowess. During August 1980, cameras captured the only footage of their frenetic operations to build these stages. From the moment the fleet of trucks arrived until the lights went down and the music began. The project was edited as a behind-the-scenes documentary on the engineering of the concerts to be presented to the loyal, enthusiastic fans of the band. Perhaps more significant, this performance would be the last for the band with all the original members who recorded the album. In the melee of the breakup, this documentary was archived and forgotten for nearly a quarter century. Witness now the building of the wall and the lost documentary. I always knew, right from uh, the word go, I knew that this was going to be a record, three or four cities and a movie, because I knew it couldn't possibly travel. In my opinion, it's just miles ahead of anything else that's ever been done in rock and roll. I certainly will never attempt to take this kind of thing any further than I've taken it in this show. Because there's no point, really. It's incredibly expensive to do. It's an enormous amount of effort goes into it. I really don't work for any bands par se. I just work for Floyd. They do get me occasional work with other bands through their organization, Britannia Row. But basically, I just work for them. I mean, if you start at the top, it's hard to work down. Once you have a certain expertise in, you know, like ruining your body with a lot of work, you, it's easy to get jobs, you know? A lot of people want to hire you. I did it because I enjoyed it. Uh, it's a different life. It's kind of uh, more like the outlaw life. It's nice to be a part of it because it is magic when the crowd comes in and you, you're part of something and you see that many people really enjoy themselves and are so enthusiastic. You get a tremendous amount of energy off of it. We can more or less leave it there because there's a lot of stuff in there that's going to go up the front. It's a lot of hard work. People think it's real glamorous, but they weren't here in the last 24 hours when we did 24 hours straight load in of this stuff. There, there are some extremely, you know, talented people out there all working their buns off to try and get it right every night. Because, well, you've looked at it a lot, and it's fucking difficult to do. These units in pairs lift up a 20 foot by 4 foot platform on which the bricklayers stand. So each one of these units weighs about uh, 500 pounds. The stage itself weighs another 20 tons, so there's about 30 tons of equipment in the wall and the staging itself. Mostly aluminium. That's the one that's got to be exactly right. The critical thing about them is they've got to be in a dead straight line and dead level, because they, they make one whole 100 foot long box girder, which has got to be exactly straight and level. Bang on. Okay. Try this one again. Good. 
Sorry, I'm sorry. This one here. That's great. Okay, I think we're on. The actual hydraulic units within the crates are modified standard production units, but the whole of this lot was purpose designed and purpose built for this specific operation. Well, it's high technology. I briefed Jonathan as the engineer in September of 79, which was nearly a year after I started working on the designs for it. And uh, the original plan, in fact, was to knock the bricks onto the audience, so we spent a lot of time looking at very light bricks that would disintegrate when the audience hit them, foam bricks and things like that. Usually when you say, I'm a rigger, people say, What's that? You know? uh, it's a very small field, and there's a few, only a few people that do it. OK, Rocky. Now let it go up slowly. Mick, could you watch the cables? Yeah. A rigger's job is to climb up in the beams, pull up the chain hoist, pull up the block and falls, and get everything ready to fly up, and also to ensure the safety of, obviously, the audience and the band. And after a while, I get used to working at heights, so we're not uh, become accustomed to working at those heights. And just the heights don't scare you at all anymore. I mean, obviously, you always have a fear of dying, but uh, an order of magnitude for our rigging, this show is probably twice the size of the largest show we've ever been involved with, or perhaps twice the size of the largest show I've even heard of. because it's 100 feet to the ceiling, we had to obtain 100 foot long chains so that all these trusses and flying tracks could be taken right up to the ceiling. And it's about $50,000 worth of chain that had to be acquired to do this particular show here. Just in the rigging and hoist, probably well over $100,000 worth of equipment just to fly the trusses in and out and fly the pig in and out and fly the inflatables. Uh, we'll probably be working right to Monday. The show is Monday night. So <laughs> if we're lucky, we'll get eight hours sleep between now and then, probably. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, masochist is great. So they're pretty big as inflatables go. The biggest one is about 35 feet high, the mother figure weighs about a quarter of a ton. Jerry Scarf did drawings of them and I made sculptures from that and then built the inflatables from the sculptures with two sewing machines and one lady who helped me. I don't know, I've known Jerry for years anyway. We'd always talked about working together. He'd worked on um, some animation that went with uh, the Wish You Were Here album, which was half the show that, that we did in 1977. Some of the animation in that show was very successful and some of it wasn't. We learned a great deal by doing that, that he had to do all the key drawings, you know, because the power of his work is really, you know, is actually not cerebral. It's, it's actually in those, you know, pencil strokes and brush strokes. So, he, so when we did this, he did an awful lot more of the, the drawing himself. When we first knocked a little bit of the wall down in Culver City, and we built up a piece which was about 15 feet high and about 25 feet long, and we knocked it down, and that was the first time any of the equipment that we'd made was actually put into operation. But the idea is to collapse the wall uh, progressively. I mean, we could bring the wall down in about five seconds flat. But that would be not so um, interesting as bringing it down in 15, 20 seconds. We always envisaged it might be used outdoors, so we designed it uh, structurally to withstand 20 to 30 mile an hour winds. Each of these towers, these rather um, <clears throat> dirty looking blue towers, will have a ton of uh, sand ballast on the bottom to stop them tipping over in, a, you know, in case this wind should spring up. <laughs> It's rather like Newton's apple, you know, when he discovered gravity. An apple weighs, what, two pounds sometimes, if it's a big one. 
and it works out that there's some effect of gravity which comes to about the same number. I forget what it is. The same thing with this. They, they actually cost 18 pounds, and they weigh, well, 18 pounds each as well. So there you go. English again. Basically, at the moment, we're just getting sound checks, going through each individual mic, making sure it all works, and uh, trying to get sounds on the individual instruments. There's three of us mixing the sound. I've got everything subgrouped down, so I'm mixing the band overall. And I've got two other guys feeding me with various channels and uh, someone else working the quad system, because we're all in quad. So when, fl when stuff flies around the room, um, we've got a guy just working that. I've got uh, about 106 input channels, not including echo returns at the moment, so there's 106 microphones coming in. We've got three eight-track tape machines um, during the course of the show. The majority of the music that you're hearing is live from the band. There's one or two uh, things we've got for cue tracks, click tapes, uh, just so that we can sync in with sound effects. We've got various sound effects that were on the album which I remixed into uh, a quad format for this sort of room. And we play those in uh, with the band, just to make it sound more like the album, really. Peter Woods. Uh, Shut up. Hello, good evening. Hello. Welcome. How are you? Could you play the efficient piano, please? Thank you. Yes, yeah, no. That's it, bring it up stage. All right, next one right here. Vertical. Earl's Court is a particular challenge for a show like this for two reasons. Number one, there's what's known as a false ceiling up 100 feet in the air. A false ceiling is made of, of soft material so that if you step on the ceiling, you'll fall right through. So when you're working in the steel above, you sometimes get a false sense of security. You see this ceiling right below you, and, and you feel like, well, you know, there's nowhere I'm going to go. But where in fact, if you do slip off the beam, you'll come 100 feet down. When I'm in here, I try and get the same sort of balance that uh, people like to hear on the record with the extra size that you get uh, in this sort of place. And uh, the main difficulty for me has been just adapting to new acoustics. The, the size of the rooms has been really uh, the main thing. The main problems we've got, there's, there's a lot of animation uh, within the show. We have three 35 millimeter projectors projecting onto the wall once it's up. And uh, those projectors are driving one of our eight-track machines over there, which has a full orchestra tape sound on it. If we have any problems at all with the uh, projectors, then it affects the sound as well. And there is the danger of the tape machine slowing down or stopping. And one night in New York, we were halfway into the show, and uh, the awful moment happened when suddenly the tape machine stopped. And uh, luckily, Nigel, who's running the maintenance back here, managed to get the whole thing organized pretty quick and they had it back going again. But for one moment there, everybody died, I think.
everything we do has to go through their architects department and the district surveyor. We put forward all the proposals, then they write back a form of consent which lays down certain safety requirements, if you like, and building, you know, and, and that part of the building regulations is applied. They set it all out in writing. And then the district surveyor and members of the GLC architects department come in and finish the, uh, check the finished structures to make sure that they do comply with all the um, requirements. Just fine today, just fine. Which one? Well, we have a problem here. Yeah. <laughs> What's happened is the seats have started being laid out from that end and they've laid forward. The stage has started being laid out from that end and it's laid forward. And where the two have met, the calculation, the legal requirement is that the two are 10 feet apart, but in fact, what's happened is that uh, they're five feet apart. And the license which, which has been issued for these performances clearly states that there must be a 10-foot gap between the uh, crash barrier and the, the first section of the stage. And uh, we haven't fulfilled that. And uh, there is a, this distinct danger that someone in the GLC could create quite a scene about it. So what the um, management of Earl's Court here have been discussing is the possibility of moving the seats back and bunching them up because obviously a mistake's been made you know calculations were made that this distance would exist and it just doesn't exist it's one that. inch per yeah. row you gain six feet really it makes any difference it's quite fine but if you made even one inch difference between all the lot and including an inch on each of the three barrel three mm. on the three watts it's you would have enough feet to make it work i don't know i mean it's a ridiculous requirement i mean 10 feet it's it's uh it was written, it's written for teeny bop shows, and of course, GLC uh, officials can, have, can make no distinction between different artists and, and make no appreciation of the fact that this audience has absolutely no desire to jump any crash barrier and, uh, and uh, grab, grab the Pink Floyds. I I've will. queued up for four hours to get this ticket and someone has even stolen my sleeping bag. I my sleeping bag, I've queued up for four hours and these, these folks, I don't know who they are, what, what they do, I've come here to watch a concert, I had my stealing, my sleeping bag stolen, and four hours. How do these people, people come and get straight to the front of the queue? Can you tell me that? That's all I want to know. I think it's a liberty. Damn liberty. Talk to me about them. They're tickets. They're for sale. What's that to say? How'd you get them? Bought them. You bought them? Yes. How long ago did you buy them? This morning. How many tickets are you allowed to buy? Right. Many as you want. Throw a every night. Hang him! Hang the towel! Hang him! <laughs> Hang him high! Scalp me! Scalp me! <laughs> I, I, I've lost my sleeping bag, and, 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 and Souths take £50 off me. £50 I've paid for this, and I've lost my sleeping bag. Well, I'm not going to go to Wales on my holiday, am I? Give me a drink for myself. Give me 20 for myself. Thank you. So you do this all the time? Yeah. Sorry? Do this all the time? Only uh, part-time. I've got a job painting and decorating in the evening. Fantastic fans. Because they love their music. They buy their records and they listen. I mean, lots of kids wander around here. They haven't got a ticket and listen outside. They're wandering around all the time, just listening to the music and sitting outside peacefully. Rock and roll is still alive, mate, in England. Steve, on the cross over, that's Mark Day 4. Bring the highs down a bit. So, so here we take care of just what the band is hearing. And out front is what the people are going to be listening to. So the people are getting what the engineer is, wants to hear. And the band are getting what each member of the band wants to hear. There's 14 speaker cabinets on stage and uh, eight sets of uh, headphones, and each of them have separate controls on it. With the house mix, is a total balance of everything without any one thing outstanding. Where the monitors is meant to just monitor a certain thing and like really boost it up and make it very predominant for that one member of the band. Yeah, I was just done trying to the phone. Uh, I mean, it's not just rock and roll, it's also stage production. There's a wall that's built, there's animation, there's 
the people that just aren't, you know, the musicians aren't just playing. It's, they're acting out parts, and it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing to do. It's a very interesting thing to be a part of. Third line, what you did before. I forgot that. It was nice. Yeah. How are we doing buzz wise? I don't know. Let's check with Chaz and. One. Is that enough for the singers? We've got a bit of a hum, so yes, for now that's fine. Okay. The Pink Floyd are, are probably the masters at being, being able to present a show in a large building, such as an Earl's Court or a Madison Square Garden or whatever. There's very few acts that can do that and get away with it and really deliver a show that even the guy sitting in the last seat up in the gallery can enjoy. It's a craft to produce a finished product that, you know, is itself. And that's what this is. It's not me. I'm, I'm actually not a bleak person at all, in fact. I'm, I'm uh, very content at the moment. I mean, obviously, a lot of it's drawn from my own experience, but it's not my own autobiography. in a few minutes so we're going in 10 minutes at 20 to 9 so can everybody adopt their positions Mike have you done the rear projector yet can you tweak him up on here so he can hear himself yeah. or are you all right can you hear here once you've done that can you um hassle the front projectors and when you speak to them warn them that we're about to do a walkthrough for which film is required do you require sound as well, really? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Eight minutes to rehearsal. Their lighting and effects of all from day one have always been very intricate. And it's just developed from there, and every show's got bigger and bigger and bigger. I think this is the definitive show, actually. It's hard, but it's, um, I mean, you know, most of the work, of course, is done by their technical people and they've built around themselves an organisation that can cope with these kind of situations. Because what they give is pure entertainment. And every time the Pink Floyd go out, it's an event. The best shows are when the audience give back to the musicians on stage, because a successful show is the reaction between the audience sitting on the other side of the wall as such, and the band playing over the wall. There's definitely an interface here. In this instance, it's a wall. that we did, there was a uh, general sense of alarm that we might have to play all night because the walls seemed to be going up so slowly. It's a hard question to answer. It's just something that once you get it in your blood, it's hard to get out. No matter how, you know, much you get pushed to the breaking point, you seem to always come back. You never, you never remember the bad times, only the good, you know?